An empty hospital bed can be an awful thing. The scene of a lost struggle, the failure of medicine, the beginning of grief. I remember walking down a hospital corridor to visit my college roommate, Jordan, who was very ill, a wasting shadow of his former self. He had been class president. He knew the name of everyone on campus. The world would have loved him. But I saw his life fade painfully away only a few years before the development of miracle drugs that could have saved him. It was 1993, and AIDS had left another hospital bed empty. A decade later, the global AIDS crisis was a cresting wave of death across much of Africa. In the worst affected countries, life expectancies decreased by 20 years. During visits as a government official, I remember walking through South African shanty towns and mainly meeting grandparents and their grandchildren. Much of an intervening generation had been swept away. Millions of people were dying at the same time and yet in total isolation, surrounded by the barbed wire of stigma. The advance of a microbe announced itself in striking, horrifying ways. A physician friend began doing small-scale AIDS treatment in Zambia around 2000. When he moved to Lusaka, his daughter attended an English language school across town. Each school day, he would have to leave an hour or more early to navigate traffic jams caused by funeral processions that went on all day, every day. The human cost was difficult to witness. As a policy advisor to President Bush, I traveled to Africa quite a bit. I recall visiting an orphanage for HIV-positive children in Ethiopia run by the Sisters of Charity. Where the children slept were hundreds of beds in tidy rows. On the wall, there was a mural of Jesus and the children. You know, suffer the little children to come unto me. Each image painted in the mural, I learned, was of a real child who had died at that orphanage. Before the arrival of AIDS treatment, every child was sentenced to death. None would ever leave. Some of the children, in the words of one sister, had, quote, an easy death. Others, she said, had a harder time asking, why can't you come with me where I'm going? Why do I have to go alone? But I also remember a policy meeting at the White House, perhaps my best experience in government. I sat in the Oval Office and watched the President of the United States discuss and eventually approve the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, the largest initiative to fight a single disease in human history. Not long ago, I visited a hospital in a rural part of Rwanda at the end of a winding road to nowhere. On my tour, I asked, as I usually do, to see the ward where AIDS patients with opportunistic infections were being treated. I was told there were no cases that day. Assuming a language barrier, I asked again. There were no cases. In that part of Rwanda, AIDS treatment is essentially universal. The hospital is focused on low birth weight babies and people with diabetes and heart disease, no longer on infectious threats. In years of visiting hospitals and hospices, this is the most hopeful thing I have ever seen. Empty hospital beds, the scene of a victory, the triumph of medicine, the beginning of life and health and hope. Today, more than 13 million people are on AIDS treatment in Sub-Saharan Africa thanks to PEPFAR, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Malaria, and Tuberculosis, and the increasing contributions of countries themselves. And this, by the way, includes the children in that orphanage I visited in Addis, where now everyone receives treatment and no one dies. These are some of the largest, broadest gains in the history of public health involving actions by America in the great tradition of the Marshall Plan and the Peace Corps. And Americans who made it possible should know about it 
and be proud of it. When I stood in that empty AIDS ward in Rwanda, I thought of the great movement of conscience that made it possible, a movement uniting two very different administrations, two very different presidents, leaders in Congress from both parties, donor and partner countries, activists who have given the most vulnerable people in the world a public voice. The fight against AIDS has been a refuge from the bitterness and cynicism of our politics, a great shared moral objective that has made other differences seem small. But all this pales in comparison to what is now possible, with tools and methods from an unexpected source. We all know that the data revolution has been on its invasive, transforming march across our lives. It allows politicians and advertisers to target the narrowest demographic slivers of the public to persuade, entice, or enrage. Now we are seeing what humanitarian doctors and researchers can accomplish using data to fight a pandemic. Scientists are following improved data to the specific sites and groups where most disease is spread. We already knew that 30 countries have 89% of new AIDS infections. Because of improved data, we now know, for example, that 88% of positive tests in Tanzania come in just 22% of that nation's testing and counseling centers. And we have a good picture of the hardest hit groups, men who have sex with men, transgender people, people who inject drugs, children, and young women who are often subjected to gender-based violence. Having narrowed the epidemic map, it is now possible to flood the zone with proven prevention techniques. Male circumcision, early treatment, condoms, and the prevention of mother-to-child transmission. This is the new strategy of PEPFAR and the Global Fund tying ambition to precision. And their models indicate that the curve of new infections can be bent downward by an additional 40 to 60%. This raises a prospect comparable to medical achievements such as the eradication of smallpox or the near defeat of polio. With precise focus, and combination prevention, we could see the transmission networks decisively broken and new infections fall dramatically. After 39 million deaths, after all the suffering and mourning, we can see the beginning of the end of AIDS. A moment like this is seized or lost with consequences that reach across the generations. As usual, the challenge here is not merely technical. Medical data can identify people for help, or it can expose groups to stigma and discrimination. It can focus, or it can target. Anti-gay laws and attitudes in particular make it difficult to provide AIDS education, testing, treatment, and care, dooming the best medical strategy to failure. The data revolution in medicine only serves humanity when it is tied to humane values of generosity and inclusion. To win the fight against AIDS, we need rigor and resources and a firm determination to see the dignity that shines in every life. These values can be seen everywhere if we are alert to inspiration. I found them at work in Uganda in a refugee community on the side of a hill outside Kampala. Most of the in the settlement were women and children who had fled from up north, where a brutal cultish rebel group called the Lord's Resistance Army had killed large numbers of the men. Many of the women had terrible st stories of rape and violence. At the center of the settlement is a steep-walled, open-pit mine. The women support themselves by breaking rocks into gravel with small metal hammers. Each has her own pile, she adds to, for several hours a day. After Hurricane Katrina on America's Gulf Coast in 2005, these women, most of them HIV positive, collected $900 and sent it to the American Embassy to help with relief efforts. When I visited them 
and thank them on behalf of our government, I have never seen a group of people more proud of themselves. I was given a handwritten note that read, we want to express ourselves that we are the richest in the world, we are not poor, we are free. We also want to love others truly. Past all the science and technology, that is the inspiration we need to love others truly. And when that commitment is paired with the best science and technology, we can truly heal the world. Thank you.